Thank you all, and thank, uh, thank you, Rob, for inviting me here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with uh, these, our two distinguished criminologists. Um, and of course, what, what we've heard from them, not surprisingly, a few tidbits about their um, concerns about how the media uh, are presenting uh, criminal justice issues. Uh, that's not surprising, of course, and so uh, here I am. And don't expect me to be defending uh, what the media do. Uh, what I would rather do is talk a little bit about uh, exactly what we do, uh, why we do it, the impact it has, and what we can do to change that. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, and much of this is, is uh, this first part is going to be based on the academic literature. I'm not going to uh, cite specific studies, but generally speaking, uh, media coverage of crime and of the justice system, as you know, has been uh, covered a lot. Uh, by scholars, I'm going to focus on one specific area of that to begin with, and that is um, uh, the way in which news is selected for coverage. Um, okay, first of all, as Neil said at the beginning, he mentioned how the media tend to report uh, rare, unusual cases. Uh, that is uh, unquestionably true, and it's not really surprising either because uh, if you consider one of the definitions of news is that which is new. So uh, that which is new or rare or unusual. That, that is naturally what, uh, what uh, newspapers and television news are going to cover. Um, there's an old saying that we cover plane crashes, not plane landings. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of truth to this because, uh, I mean, obviously plane crashes are newsworthy for a number of reasons. But one of them is that it's, it's a rare, unusual major event. Plane landings are, of course, happen thousands of times a day. Uh, they're nothing out of the ordinary. They're boring. We're not going to cover them. If we did try and cover them, we'd fill up our whole paper just with that, and nobody would read it. So, uh, so obviously, we're going to cover these unusual events, and I don't think that's going to change. And that applies not only to uh, aviation, but also, of course, to crime as Neil was saying. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is three aspects of the selection of news coverage. The first is, uh, as both Neil and Julian have mentioned, uh, is that um, there is an overemphasis on violent crime in the news media. And that, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a broadsheet newspaper, uh, a tabloid newspaper, television. You know, there's evidence that, that as you move from broadsheets to tabloids to television, things get worse. But, but all of newspaper, all the news media tend to overemphasize this violent crime. That's inevitable because violent crime, as Julian was saying, makes up a small portion of overall crime, is much more unusual than property crime, and so we're going to cover that. Furthermore, we're going to cover uh, in the most detail um, those very serious violent crimes, homicides, sexual assaults, and so forth. Uh, secondly, um, Within this violent crime, this subset of serious violent crimes that we tend to overemphasize, um, we specifically overemphasize those violent crimes that are stranger on stranger crimes, right? That, that where you have a perpetrator and the victim don't know each other, where so, for some reason or other some victim was picked out by a perpetrator and killed or sexually assaulted or what have you. And if you want a perfect example of that, uh, from last year, we had um, uh, the case of Wendy Ladner Beaudry, who uh, I think you probably all know if you don't. Uh, this was the case. Uh, um, she was the sister of the former Vancouver mayoral candidate, Peter Ladner. That, of course, made this case newsworthy just by itself, that issue. But more than that, she was an affluent white female who was jogging through the park in a wooded area and was found dead. Now. It turns out that that is a very rare occurrence in Vancouver and a rare occurrence anywhere. In fact, if we look at Statistics Canada data, we find that about one in 12 uh, female homicide victims were killed by strangers, by people who don't know them, about 8%. In other words, about uh, 12 in 13 or 92% of female homicide victims knew their killers. And a very high proportion of those people, those women, knew their killers intimately and that their killers were uh, spouses, ex-spouses, boyfriends, ex-boyfriends. Despite that, despite the fact that 
the Wendy uh, Ladner Beaudry case and cases similar to it make up only one twelfth of cases involving female homicide victims, you, you remember just how much attention uh, we in the news media paid to that case. It's an unusual, rare case, but that's precisely why we paid attention to it. And the fact that we had an affluent white female as a victim uh, it fur is, is further reason why we paid attention to it. There is uh, plenty of evidence that the news media do tend to pay attention to cases based on who the victims are. Um, so that's the second thing. First of all, we have overemphasis on violent crime in the media, overemphasis on this specific type of violent crime, stranger on stranger violent crime. Uh, the third thing I want to consider is um, sentencing. We've heard a lot about sentencing from Julian and uh, about how we don't report about uh, uh, somebody receiving a fine sentence, as Julian said. Uh, and this is exactly the case, is that, that uh, and this is in keeping with the idea that we report on rare, unusual occurrences. We are, of course, going to report on rare, unusual sentences, or at least sentences that seem to be rare and unusual. Um, it's been the case, in my case, I've, I've, I've read news reports and heard about a sentence and wondered, uh, how on earth did the judge come to that sentence in that case? But upon reading the reasons for sentence, sometimes it begins to make sense because I learned there's more about this case than I thought and in fact it may seem to be a reasonable sentence after originally seeming to be completely out there. Nevertheless, what we do in the news media is tend to report these sentences that are unusual, uh, that seem unusual and that almost always means unusually light because people don't consider, it seems like there's no sentence that could be so harsh that it's considered inappropriate but many people do consider certain sentences to be inappropriately light, and those are the ones the media focus on because they happen to be unusual events. Um, let me just give an example of what I've been talking about here. Uh, first of all, I mentioned that we, we, we like to focus on this violent crime, and we in the Sun are no different. We put that on the front page. Um, a while ago, I was speaking uh, at a conference, and one lawyer in the audience happened to stand up and say to me, uh, well, you know, you guys at the Sun are just like everybody else in that you, you, you love to put the Hells Angels on the front of your paper. And I have to admit, that's true. And specifically, he said you love to put the Death's Head Skull, right, the Hells Angels logo on the front. So what do you know? This is, you won't be able to see this, all of you, but this is from Saturday, right on the front page, the Death's Head Skull, the Hells Angels. And so we've covered this. We've covered uh, violent crime, gang crime, getting it right on the front with the actual Hells Angels logo. And here we have short sentences. Right. This was about, uh, about those two house angels who got apparently light sentences for high-level drug dealing. Uh, so we managed to cover the violent crime and get the short sentences right on the front page there just this last Saturday. So that's a double whammy. Right? <laughs> okay. um, so th those are the three things I wanted to mention here, this, this overemphasis on violent crime, overemphasis on stranger-on-stranger uh, -stranger crime, and um, overemphasis on unusually light, what appear to be unusually light sentences, uh, all arising in part from this notion that we're going to focus on unusual, unusual things in our newspaper. Uh, but let's consider, it's, it, it really doesn't take a rocket scientist or, or, or a criminologist to, uh, to realize what this means, what kind of beliefs this may create among members of the public who get their information from the news media. And of course, a lot of members of the public do get their information about the criminal justice system from the news media. So what kind of beliefs is this going to produce? Well, obviously, first of all, the overemphasis on violent crime is, is likely to produce a view that violent crime is much more prevalent than it is. Um, and when people hear about crime, they're likely to think of violent crime as opposed to other kinds of crime, including the 85% that isn't violent crime. So. Uh, and it, it, this seems to be borne out by the evidence we have, which is that um, if we look at measures, uh, uh, statistics on crime, there's, there's a certain amount of debate about whether we should take the, the uniform crime reports, that is the police statistics, or the, the statistics from the general social survey, the victimization surveys. There's debate about that, and they come to different numbers, of course. But if we look at what the public think about violent <laughs> crime, it's completely different from either the police statistics or victimization surveys. And generally, it's people believe that violent crime is, of course, much more common than those surveys would suggest. Um, secondly, as Julian mentioned, people, uh, almost a very high percentage of people at least, believe that crime is increasing. 
And uh, regardless of what the, what the reality is, including in periods when it's decreasing, people tend to believe it's increasing. That's not entirely surprising, uh, given the amount of play it receives in the media. The second thing associated with this, our overemphasis on stranger on stranger crime, is that people come to the belief that, that, um, that crime is much more threatening, personally threatening, than it really is. So they come to the conclusion uh, that um, it's a jungle out there. And every time they go outside of their house, even though, of course, statistically, they're more likely to be killed inside their house, uh, they come to fear going outside their house uh, because they think this, this, they hear all this about violent crime and tend to think it's much more threatening uh, because, uh, not, only, not only because of the prevalence of the reporting, but also the stranger on stranger notion. Uh, when we know, for example, all the play that gang crime has gotten, uh, the vast majority of people killed by gangsters are gangsters. Uh, when somebody who is not a gangster happens to get caught in the crossfire, that's big news, of course. But it's extremely rare. Right? It's, you, you'd have a better chance, if you're not involved in gangs, you'd, you'd have a better chance of winning the lottery than getting killed by a gangster. Uh, and you'd have a much better chance of getting hit by a car and killed. Uh, but it doesn't seem that way when you hear about all these violent crimes that involve stranger-on-stranger -stranger violence. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, associated with this overemphasis on these light, unusual sentences, naturally, people think that uh, the courts are not doing their job. The justice system, but more specifically, the courts are simply not taking seriously this epidemic of violent crime. And, and that is why it is increasing, even though it may not be, but the belief that there's an epidemic of violent crime, that it's increasing, that's naturally because obviously the courts aren't doing their job because they're giving out all of these light, inappropriate sentences. So uh, the, these are the basic beliefs I wanted to uh, talk about that come from uh, the way in which the media select the news. Um, and the obvious result is uh, a threat to uh, public confidence in the justice system. And more specifically, that is, of course, a threat to confidence in the courts. People generally, uh, there's a lot of reasons, and, and Neil and Julian talked about this, why people would tend to have higher degrees of confidence in the police than in the courts, but one of them certainly is with this media coverage of this overemphasis on violent crime, um, and, uh, and obviously police are often quoted in these things, there's a tendency for people to get the impression that the police are working very hard here to catch the criminals, only to have those criminals let off by the courts. So in other words, the police have to fight the criminals, and then they have to turn around and fight the system, have to fight the court system again. So the courts really come in for a hard time on this, and, and, and this obviously leads people to adopt a more punitive uh, approach, uh, given that they, they, they believe there is all this violent crime, and they believe, that, um, they believe that the courts aren't doing anything about it, therefore there's no deterrent, therefore crime pays. So anybody who's considering a crime uh, is more likely to go ahead and commit it. Uh, these, these are the basic ideas that come out of this. So then the question becomes, uh, what are we supposed to do about that? Um, what are we in journalism supposed to do about this? Uh, and the answer to that question really depends on why it is um, the media cover things in this way. I think, you know, the, this structure, this, this, this idea of covering, covering rare, unusual things is, uh, is not going to go away, really. Um, one can argue that there's too much sensationalism and that there could be less sensationalism in the media coverage of crime, de details of grisly crimes, that I agree with. But I don't think we're going to get away from the basic idea of covering, covering these unusual events. But more than that, people suggest that there's actually, many people, this is more common in the United States, but, but also here, people suggest that there is some grand conspiracy that the media know what the truth is, know the accurate picture of crime, but that we're covering that up. And we're covering it up so that we can pursue our specific, specific agenda, which is usually described as, well, it's, it's not really described, but usually it's the liberal agenda, whatever that is. Now, that's an interesting view because, of course, the way in which the media cover crime, as I said, leads to a more punitive approach. So it's very odd that the liberal media would purposely be doing that, if that were the case. Um, 
But, but leaving that aside, I would just say these conspiracy theorists that suggest that, that, that you know, we all know what the truth is in the media and we're all trying to twist this around for our own perverse reasons really gives us too much credit, quite frankly. We're, we're not that smart, right? Um, I mean, we're really not. It's very hard. If you, if you go to a newspaper during the day or you go to a, a, a television news station, you will see people running around trying to get their story. They, they come in in the morning. They're assigned a story. They have a few hours to familiarize themselves with what this is about, go and interview the proper people, write something up that explains this accurately and also in a lively, accessible way so people will actually want to read it or watch it on TV. That's a lot of things to do in a very short period of time. And most of the time, these people are running around hoping to get this thing done in time for their editors, uh, as opposed to some sort of uh, having some sort of idea of how they can fit this in with this broad agenda that we supposedly have. Uh, the other thing I would say is to just go right back on the assumption I was saying, I was talking about how the, 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 this notion that we have an agenda, people suggest we know what the truth is, we know what the real picture of crime is, but we're, 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 we're putting forward this, we're covering that up and putting forward this other idea. Uh, I would question that right from the beginning. I would question that whether we know what the true picture of crime is. And the, the reason I do this, I don't have academic data to back this up, but I can tell you just anecdotally, in my experience, talking to many reporters, many editors, many media officials, I don't think they do know what the true picture of crime is. I think they happen, in very large numbers, happen to share the very same erroneous beliefs that they are conveying to the public. And uh, there are many journalists, unquestionably, that believe, uh, believe uh, violent crime is more prevalent than it is that it's increasing, and especially there's a very, a very high number of journalists I've talked to who believe the courts aren't doing anything, that the courts are too lenient, and that's why we have this problem with this apparently increasing violent crime. It is not uncommon to find those beliefs among people in the media, and people in the media are, of course, members of the public, and, and they share a lot of these beliefs. So that would lead us to, as uh, Neil was saying, that would lead us to the notion that, okay, if, if we have these uh, inaccurate beliefs, these erroneous beliefs uh, produced as a result of lack of information, lack of education, then the solution to that, uh, one would expect, would be education. And I'll talk briefly about that in, in, in my column that was handed out. I talked about a lot of the measures that I think could help. So I'll just highlight some of those very briefly. I do think it's important for journalists to have a better understanding of the law of the justice system, of the courts, of the way the law and the courts work. And it's not, most journalists don't have a particularly good understanding of that. Um, further, I think it would be helpful if journalists understood the impact of their own work. Um, these things I've just been talking about, the way in which uh, news coverage is selected uh, and the impact it has, I don't think a lot of journalists actually know that. I don't think they're even aware of that. So it would, it would be helpful if they came to a better understanding of that and, and of the law. But equally, I think it's really important for justice officials to understand exactly how journalism works. And, and many people in the justice system, many people in academia, don't really understand what, what uh, it is like for a reporter who has to write on these things. And particularly, they need to understand the very serious constraints in terms of time and space under which um, journalists work. Uh, so in other words, I think, I, th I think we need you know, mutual education. There needs to be better education of journalists about the law, but also better education of lawyers and people in the justice system about uh, journalism. And I think there's also room to develop a uh, closer relationship among these two groups of people. Uh, that's controversial. Uh, sometimes you know, people don't want to get too close for fear of compromising their objectivity and then in the case of journalists they may not want to get too close to people in the justice system because it means that um, when they need to be critical of the justice system or people in the justice system they'll resist doing it because they become friendly with those people. So I understand that tension but nevertheless I think there's a lot to be gained from a better understanding of the roles these two groups play um, and also an understanding of the actual substance of these things, an understanding of journalism, an understanding of law and the courts. And that's something that really needs to begin, I think, before people become involved, before people embark on a full-time career in the justice system or in the legal field uh, or in uh, journalism. And it really needs to begin 
at least at the level of university education. Interestingly, if one looks at journalism schools, you'll find very little attention paid to the law. Uh, typically, there will be a media law course, but that course will, of course, focus on issues like freedom of the press and defamation law, which are important, but it's not a broad introduction to the law and to how uh, to do legal reporting in a responsible way. Similarly, um, if you look in uh, law schools, there's virtually nothing focusing on media other than, again, possibly a media law course, but nothing really about journalism, how it works. When I went to law school, which was a little over 20 years ago, uh, there, there was not a single course, there was not a single discussion of the role the media play in reporting on justice issues. In, in my three years there, I don't remember ever there being a discussion about that. So those things are important, and that's something that really needs to continue this kind of education. Of course, we know that people be educated about something and then forget about it. Uh, so, so we need to um, keep this up. There needs to be a kind of continuing education program, I think, for both journalists and justice officials on these subjects. And there, there have been some steps made in that direction. We do have some conferences that bring together justice officials and journalists uh, to talk about these things and also lectures to, to help them understand each other's profession. There are also some courses now at some universities, uh, some courses in law for journalists and some courses in journalism for justice officials, but it's still quite limited. Um, the next thing uh, I'll highlight is uh, there has recently been a lot more of people called media liaisons in um, min ministries of the Attorney General, uh, executive legal officers in courts, and here in BC and some other provinces we have a communications council with the Crown. So it's a Crown attorney that actually functions to, to communicate with journalists about issues to help them out. All of these things I think are helpful. Um, they can help to explain certain things to the media and what we see at the Supreme Court level now is not only an executive uh, legal officer but in fact media lockups much like they have for, for other government issues. For example, if, if a budget is released there's usually a media lockup where the media can go in there, get the budget ahead of time, ask questions about it um, and, and be able to write their stories or, or do their stories on television uh, prior so they can get it out to the public early. Uh, the Supreme Court now does this in Ottawa, has a media lockup where journalists can go there. There'll be an executive legal officer there that can help them with questions about a judgment when they're releasing a major judgment, and they can get a head start there before they go out to write this. So there is room there, I think, for better reporting. And while I don't know of any studies that, that test whether these communications council and executive legal officers have been helpful, um, I do know, again, anecdotally, from talking to people in the system, they do think this has helped with the accuracy of reporting. Um, let me just mention one more thing before I go to my last point, which I mentioned in, in the column, this notion of press judges. Some people have suggested that we need to go beyond simply having the media tell us what a judgment said or something about the law. Why not just go right to the judges? Now, the standard view, of course, is, uh, and what you will hear from judges, is that judges speak through their judgments. Um, that they're, they're not going to talk about the judgments beyond that. Their opinion is in the judgment, the arguments are all there, and so forth. Uh, the difficulty with that, of course, is that very few people are inclined or have the time to read a court judgment, many of which are very long. And further, some of them happen to have, some of them happen to be rather technical legally, and so a lot of people would have difficulty with that if they're not familiar with, with the law. So in other words, what it requires is the media to interpret this, to, to explain these judgments to, to the public, but that's a problem if the people doing so don't really understand this either. Uh, as a result, there has been the suggestion that maybe judges should just speak directly. And this is being done and has been done for some time in the Netherlands, where they're not speaking directly to the public, they're still, it's still mediated in, in that they're still speaking through the media to the public, speaking on television, speaking on newspapers, and these press judges are sitting members of the judiciary who actually do talk about specific cases. That is very controversial, not least among judges, uh, because judges being very concerned about their independence, it's very controversial, this notion, not only of judges speaking, but of speaking specifically about individual cases. Very unusual. Nevertheless, several countries have uh, looked at this system and, and, and and uh, given it basically a thumbs up. Um, let me just say, after I wrote about press judges, the Attorney General of BC called me to ask me about that. Uh, so he was obviously intrigued about this notion of press judges as well. Um, there's an alternative to this, uh, which we see in England in some places, where you have judges who are trained to deal with the media, who understand how to deal with the media. Um, 
and who will talk to the media but don't talk about specific cases. So that's a little bit less. But, but uh, you know, it's food for thought, um, uh, this, this notion of judges becoming uh, more proactive and, and, and stepping out. At the same time, I admit there are, there are these concerns and it remains a controversial thing. But there's one other thing I want to mention finally in the last five minutes, and that is everything I've said so far and what we've been talking about is this notion that to the extent that people lack confidence in the, uh, in, in the justice system, it is a product of um, erroneous beliefs, which is a product of lack of information or misinformation. So our view is that, and what I've been saying here, is that what we need to do is provide accurate information. Uh, I wish it were really that easy. I think that can make a difference, and Neil did mention, uh, when he talked about the booklet on crime, did mention that there's some evidence that that can actually change people's beliefs. Nevertheless, as you all know, uh, you all hold beliefs, and you all know that um, your beliefs are important to you, and they don't change that easily. And many, many people protect, protect their beliefs in much the same way as people protect their children, right? You, you, you don't want to give up your beliefs for anything. So we hear about that, we hear about confirmation bias, this notion that people are going to selectively attend to those things that confirm what they already believe. And there's a lot of interesting research done on this uh, with respect to opinions regarding the justice system, issues like capital punishment, issues like gun control, that suggest that people who have these very strong beliefs um, about, say, capital punishment, when they are presented with evidence from studies that suggest that capital punishment might not be such a good idea, that it doesn't act as a deterrent, doesn't lead to reduced crime rates, when they're presented with that kind of contrary evidence, one would expect uh, that they would moderate their views somewhat. But in fact, what's been found is that they actually strengthen their views. So they're pro-capital punishment, they receive some evidence that suggests capital punishment's not such a good idea, they become more pro-capital punishment. The exact same thing happens, has happened in these studies with people who are anti-capital punishment. And they're given studies that suggest capital punishment may be a good idea, it may, it may be a deterrent, it may lead to lower crime rates. Again, those people become more anti-capital anti punishment. So what we see basically is that simply providing the evidence simply providing information, accurate information, I don't think is going to be enough to change everybody's viewpoint. It may change some people's, but, but people are complex and people's beliefs are important to them. So it's not likely simply providing information is always going to work to change that. Instead, what we see is, I think this is part of a larger issue that people don't organize their worlds on the basis of the facts, on the basis of the information they get. That's important. But what we do is we organize those facts and that information through stories, right? Through stories we tell. And every culture has all sorts of stories, cultural myths and legends. But even on a day-to-day -day basis, we tell ourselves stories, we hear stories. This allows us to arrange the facts. We're bombarded with all these facts all the time. We have to make sense of them somehow. And we do that and we give meaning to the facts through these stories we tell. So I think ultimately, if we're going to change people's beliefs on these issues, yes, we need to have uh, proper, accurate information. But more broadly, we need to deliver that information within uh, stories that, that signify to people uh, the meaning of those facts and why they matter. Now, interestingly, that is uh, precisely what the media do. Uh, if you want to tell good stories, you go to the media. The, the, the whole idea of journalism is not simply to list a bunch of facts in, 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 a, in a story. We don't do that. Nobody would read the paper. We tell stories. And uh, so in, just in concluding here, uh, I want to stress that while the information is important, it's also important to ensure that that information is delivered in a story package that will resonate with people uh, in order to make a difference. And for that to happen, I mean, right now the, the, the media tell stories, but the typical story is about, uh, about a victim and about what's happened to them and how awful that is and about how uh, the, the, the perpetrator is a predator. And that's typically the characters, the cast of characters you have in this story. What we need is broader stories that tell us more about how the justice system works, that tell us more about offenders, that tell us more about victims, that tell us more about other people who are involved with the justice system. So let me just finish with, this is a quote from uh, Legal Aid Ontario, uh, who were speaking before a panel, a representative with Legal Aid Ontario, and what they said is they said they would be happy to assist the media in tracking down 
these interesting stories and said, by telling a variety of stories instead of just the stories that provoke fear and anger, which is what we do now largely, we can help the public to gain a better understanding of the justice system and how it works. And I think that's exactly how we need to do this, providing the information within these broader stories and variety of stories, which could help to change people's opinions. And that's it. Thank you.